A number of years ago, I read a book about the experiences of people in Stalin's Soviet Union. And one of the interesting things about it was, it was people's realization of what exactly was happening. The moment that people realized what Stalin was, um, when you know, the sort of tipping point arrived where people had to face the fact, individual Russians had to face the fact that this is not the utopia we wanted. Um, we can't hide from what this is anymore. We can't go into denial anymore. We can't say that out of the ashes of the old uh, way of things, the czars and the capitalist or whatever uh, aristocratic, autocratic regime, we're going to have a bright new future. We can't do that anymore because that's sort of a dodge. That's not actually what is happening. And we're lying to ourselves if we think or if we tell ourselves that that is what is happening. Um, there was a, just a little scene where these, in the novel, a little vignette where these two women are talking and they hear about somebody that they vaguely know whom they simply can't believe is a enemy of the people as the jargon described these people at the time. Um, <clears throat> they say, oh, so-and-so has been arrested. What, what could that person have possibly done? You know, they were in some obscure job where they didn't have any ability to cause any damage or whatever, and they didn't seem to be the sort of person who would do it. And the other woman says to her, looks her straight in the eye and says, you, do we understand now, the two of us, they're arresting people for nothing. Arresting them, sentencing them to 25 years in Siberia, or shooting them for nothing. Um... That's quite a shocking realization, and it's, I would say, it indicates a degree of honesty and a degree of willingness to face that horrible truth where a belief in right and wrong and good and evil people can be demasked that quickly. Or perhaps that was just the final straw. Everyone sort of suspected this, that these vans that showed up in the middle of the night and carted off piles of prisoners to God knows where weren't really enforcing any law. They weren't punishing any crime. They were just arresting people because that's what the system does. That's what high Stalinism does, right? Um, <clears throat> in the name of humanitarianism, in the name of um, making a better world, building a utopia, in the name of the best possible future for humanity, they filled Siberian labor camps and Siberian mass graves. You know, can't we see this now? They're doing this for no reason. <clears throat> I think, to be honest, they did have a reason for doing it. They did it to instill a sense of terror in the population, uh, to further enslave everybody. This is not freedom that Stalin has brought us. This is slavery, murder, terror and deprivation, really. Um, and we might as well just look facts in the face now. With that sudden realization, that sudden tipping of the scales, what did these people then see when they looked at the world around them, around them with this new vision? Instead of people reluctantly punishing people and trying to rehabilitate prisoners, you would suddenly realize that your state, the state that you lived in, and for a number of years, possibly a decade or so, you have told yourself is a good country going somewhere wonderful. You suddenly realize that it's your country is the world's largest prison and execution chamber. And all of this is being done in the name of goodness. There are still people under those circumstances who went along with the system. Lots of them. To this day, there are people who pine for the Stalin era, saying, well, at least you knew what 
what was up and what was down, what was right and what was wrong. It was very simple um, there, you know, and, and it's sort of an admission that humans are often willing to pay that price for moral certainty. I, in countries where, say, religious fundamentalism is now holding sway, a lot of people, I think, make that same deal with their conscience. They're willing to accept the fact that there's a lot of it injustice in their society. I'm sure that a lot of people in places like Saudi Arabia know that there's a lot going on in their country that kind of doesn't fit in with the official mythology. Like, you know, little stories that you get about Saudi princes drunkenly bullying their, um, their staff or just random strangers because they can get away with it all in the name of Wahhabism, which is a fundamentalist type of Islam that is supposed to end all of this sort of thing. It's supposed to result in a wonderful um, Islamic utopia. People must know that this is happening in Saudi Arabia, but because they want to believe in the end, if they want, they want to believe in this idea of a wonderful, austere, simple society where everything is morally and ethically clear, they become accomplices in a pretty horrible um, machine. Uh, Saudi Arabia is one big mass of hypocrisy. I, I say the Western news media. I've never been to Saudi Arabia, so I honestly don't know what's going on there. I have to rely on what BBC and CNN tell me. And other people that I've spoken to have been there who kind of confirm that. It's not what it presents itself as. It presents itself as the kingdom of the righteous and where we really <clears throat> are completely intolerant of evil and we strongly promote the good and we're the most righteous and upright people on the planet. That's what you know, a lot of people living in Saudi Arabia must tell themselves. But they see things that they don't want to see. So you just put that out of your mind. You say, that's an aberration. That's just not really what, you know, this is an exception to the rule. This is, you know, kind of mirrors the Stalinist idea of, well, yeah, all these terrible things are happening, but almost certainly, well, certainly, Stalin doesn't know. It's his underlings that are doing this. Intelligent people were quoted as saying this in the high Stalinist period where millions of people were disappearing into the gulags and the um, execution chambers. Um, they would say, well... Yes, I, I see that all this is happening, but if only somebody would tell Stalin. Stalin was at the center of it, signing execution lists of thousands of people with, you know, in one signature. Kill them all. He knew, but people didn't want to face this. Now, again, you can't, <clears throat> you can't prove this. Um, a lot of people say this about Putin's Russia right now. But a lot of, pe a lot of people know, and it's pretty obvious, that Putin has created this massive image um, of him as the restorer and the savior of Russia. And it's kind of a neo-Stalinist kind of thing, because I think people know that there's a lot of thuggishness going on in, the, in, in Russia. That in many ways, at the you know, level of the common people, <clears throat> it's a mafia state, right? You have to, it was like, you know... Chicago in the 1930s, you had an official government in Washington or in, you know, in, in the state government in Illinois. But who were the people that really ran the day-to-day -day lives of most people? Or who were the most influential people in, in most people's day-to-day -day lives? It's the local Sicilian or Irish gangster who had the most real impact on people's lives. But you could still go out in the streets and wave the, you know, the stars and stripes and God bless America and all this sort of thing, because you believed in all these ideals, even though on a day-to-day -day basis, these ideals were routinely mocked in, say, the south side of Chicago or, you know, New York City or wherever. The people's day-to-day -day reality did not match the stated ideology of, you know, the United States. <clears throat> And, but this did nothing to shake people's patriotism. 
because there's the ideal that we all believe in here, and then there's the day-to-day -day reality, which doesn't really reflect the overall ideal in our particular locality. There's local abuses here, and everybody knows that, you know, the, the O'Leary brothers um, just push everybody in the area around and, and frighten people, and uh, if someone really crosses them, they just end up dead or beaten to a pulp and left in the street as an, an example to everybody else. Like, I'm not saying that... Chicago in the 1930s was that bad, but you know, you, you understood that there were certain lines you can't cross, even though it ran completely counter to what deep down you believed America stood for. Um, <clears throat> this doesn't make sense, but human beings are able to reconcile these two things in their minds. You know, the, the loud-lunged American patriot who was also a racist. This makes no sense, but the human mind is capable of having these weird compartmentalized and contradictory beliefs or whatever. Because we want to believe in the ideals. People ignored the gulag under Stalin because they wanted to believe that everything was wonderful. Now take that a step further. People wanted to believe that things were wonderful in order, in some cases, and you can't prove this, in order to justify their own bad behavior. So you interview somebody in uh, the local NKVD um, building in a Russian town in the 1930s, and yeah, I've beaten people to a pulp here, and I've, you know, loaded them into trucks where I knew where they were going off to be shot. Um, yeah, I don't think you'd ever get anybody to admit any of this. Um, and I knew that all this was happening, but I went along with it anyway, um, because these were just bad people. You know, what, what, what do I care what happens to them? You know, the hell with them. Um, and I kind of enjoyed mistreating them. They're, they're garbage. Who cares? They're, they're kulaks. They're enemies of the people. They're wreckers. They're just flies in the ointment of this great ideal. So... You know, so if I get a little bit of fun bullying them and kicking them in the teeth and things like that, well, you know, I'm human. And who wouldn't want to kick these horrible people in the teeth? Who wouldn't want to torture them? It's kind of fun, isn't it? In fact, I really look forward to the days where I get to torture somebody. You know, you see where this is, this can lead, right? Um... There's an interesting quote by Aldous Huxley. There's any number of quotes that express this. But this one here is the most succinct one, of course, Aldous Huxley being a master of the English language. Um, <clears throat> puts it very well. The surest way to work up a crusade in favor of some good cause, some good cause, remember here, is to promise people they will have a chance of maltreating someone. To be able to destroy with good conscience, to be able to behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation, this is the height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats. Now, <clears throat> that to me is uh, one of these masterpieces of literary shorthand. He's jammed so much in there, and it's it's satire, it's a satirical novel uh, at Chrome Yellow that he wrote, but it's just making fun of the pretensions of a bunch of phonies, really, and this is, you know, the, the, the conversations that they had, uh, just, even if just sort of denouncing somebody and saying that this is an evil person, it's kind of, ooh, I feel good, you know, um, <clears throat> you see on the news that some particularly heinous criminal, you know, rapist, pedophile, serial killer, take your pick, gets captured, and everybody gets to go over in their head what they would do if they were in the cell with the, the, this evil person. They get to sort of fantasize about all kinds of horrible things they would do to this person, because it's okay to do that to them. Um... It's okay, this is a bad person, so do whatever you like. Um, <clears throat> and what do you like to do? There's all the torture implements over there. 
there's the prisoner. Oh, and not only that, you can do this with a clear conscience. This is a bad person. I imagine <clears throat> Stalinism in, in the old Soviet Union would have been impossible without this mindset, without this sort of double think that I can see people developing. Um, and it happens to you and you don't even realize you're doing it. Um, look at in Mendham, his videos, okay? <clears throat> he presents such a tempting target for everyone else's scorn and ridicule that you can needle him and drive him into a blind rage and then laugh at his reaction. And you get a little, <laughs> you know, I get that feeling. It's not nice, is it? You're deliberately causing somebody to flip their lid and get extremely angry and very defensive and all this sort of thing. Let's see it for what it is. Let's look at it for what it is. We're not being nice. We're telling ourselves that we're being nice, but we're indulging our inner sadist for a few seconds, aren't we? Let's make no mistake about that. <clears throat> now, when you're just sort of arguing on YouTube, it doesn't really, you know, we, we kind of have the unwritten rule. If you're going to stick your ugly mug like I do uh, in front of a webcam and broadcast it for anyone who wants to click their mouse and see your video, and you, you, you draw a pile of hostile, even vicious uh, criticism, abuse, whatever, well, okay, you stepped into the ring. If you get your lights punched out, you, under, you understood that before you stepped in the ring. I'm not saying that um, that this is bad that this happens, but let's just not kid ourselves. That's all that I'm, I'm saying. Let's just be honest. What What's really happening here? And how did, how did it switch over so quickly? How did we go from, oh, I feel so sorry for this person because they were on the receiving end of this or that heinous act to, oh, I can't wait to, for my chance to, you know, carry out these heinous acts on that person who has now done these terrible things. They're now fair game for my rage. They're now fair game for my inner demons, for my sadism. And I can do it under cover of morality. I can do it under color, cover of being ethical. I can do it under cover of being a wonderful person. I mentioned Saudi Arabia. You have people whose, I presume, whose job is to lop off limbs or heads or cane people or whatever. What kind of a person would migrate to that job? Is that a pious Muslim, a sincerely pious Muslim who honestly believes that they're doing an unpleasant job for the better good of society? Or do you suppose that people would migrate towards that job because they actually get to be cruel and vicious to people, but they get to tell themselves and everybody else that they're just doing an unpleasant job, but really, they actually just want to flog people. They just actually want to behead people. They actually want to lord it over people who are terrified of them um, because the enforcement um, regime of any legal system allows coercion. It allows punishment. It allows you to walk around and make other people vaguely afraid of you or actually terrified of you, depending on the severity of the or the extensiveness of the power available to the cops or the moral police or the secret police or whatever. <clears throat> and as I say, in, in the case of the Soviet Union, in the case of Stalinism, Punishing and arresting and terrifying people was an end in itself. It was an actual pillar of the regime. Um, the line in 1984 from George Orwell, he said blatantly, O'Brien, the, um, the party member who was torturing Winston, he says, no, 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 no. The purpose of torture is torture. The purpose of execution is executing people. The end of, the end result we want here is to keep torturing, executing, terrifying, and brutalizing people. We're not going anywhere with this. This is an end in itself. So we get to actually 
do all of this in the name of this ideology, which is the most sublime ideology ever created called Ingsoc and the greatest leader in human history, Big Brother. We're all doing this in his name uh, or in the name of this ideology. Therefore, because this is so fabulous, the sky is the limit in terms of what we can do to enforce it. Of course, both Chrome Yellow, the Aldous Huxley novel I quoted, and 1984 were satires. Uh, but it touches a nerve, right? You know, you get the impression that some people, when they watch the news, they want to be shocked so that they can then say, ah, this serial killer, I want terrible things to happen to that person, and I would really enjoy doing it myself, and, you know, this kind of thing. And, <clears throat> again, this is so imperceptible that, you know, the, 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 the tipping point between these two states, um, where you go from, yeah, that's a very good idea, very moral, to, oh, the downside of this is we have to torture people, to, oh, okay, I'll join that crusade if I get to be one of the torturers type thing. That's so imperceptible, and you don't really understand, even I, I assume in many cases that it's happening to yourself, again, the de-Stalinization period, or I would assume the denazification period in, in Germany afterwards, after the war, resulted in a lot of people reassessing their own pasts and saying, oh, I really lost my way here. I... How, how did this happen? How was this possible? I thought this was a wonderful idea, and I, look what I ended up doing. I ended up ankles deep in blood that I'd spilled myself. What's going on? How was this possible? Very simple. You swallowed the idea, or you told yourself you'd swallowed the idea that there are good people and there are bad people. And the bad people are fair game. And because of this good-evil split, you didn't notice what was happening to you. You didn't notice how you were being corrupted by this. How right and wrong, good and evil, can actually corrupt people and turn people into wild beasts in the name of being good. <clears throat> because... As in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, O Stalin. How quickly would the power that the secret police had go to their heads? Um, how quickly would people be corrupted by the habit of beating people or shooting them on a regular basis as a job? Um, how quickly would... You start to get these strange impulses that you don't want to listen to, uh, at least consciously, that this is fun torturing people. Now look what you've become. Look what you've become without even realizing it. Because you believe that you're on the good side. You're the good people. Look at these hellish Balkan wars or the wars in Syria. Everybody believes that they are the good people. Ergo, if the people from the next ethnicity over in the next town or valley in, in Syria um, fall into our hands or are at our mercy, we do whatever we want to them because they are just plain evil. But, wait a minute. Why are they evil? Because they do such horrible things. Yeah, but what, you're doing horrible things to them. Yeah, but that's because they're evil, though, you see. Oh, that's uh, really terrifying. And again... It's so invidious, uh, it's so, so sublogical, the process whereby this can happen to you. Uh, and it's, and it, you can't really detect it in somebody else. You can't really say that, ah, I know why this person's really doing what they're doing. You don't know. You can only, only if you examine yourself and you can sort of say, yeah, I, I can see that happening to me if I'm not bloody careful. Because, you know, so, so such and such a person makes me angry so much that, yeah, I'd like to have them in my power. Uh, that jerk at work that constantly is pestering me or ratting me out to the boss or whatever. Um, that's a bad person. I'd love to rat them out to the boss. Because um, they deserve it, you see. 
because uh, they're always doing it to me. So I'm just defending myself. I'm just standing up for myself. I'm just, you know, expressing righteous indignation at this person's bad behavior. Um, therefore, since they're bad people, I get to be bad to them. And it's not even bad, really. It's actually moral because it's species of self-defense or upholding the righteous order of things. Um, I find a lot of activism works that way. A lot of this morally certain kind of purpose that people manage to build up in their lives. Uh, you know, it's more or less, it's not horrifying. It doesn't really horrify me to, 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 to talk like this. You know, to sort of say that our society really at a fundamental level is not what it purports to be. I want to see things for what they are. And I'm not saying that everybody who's a cop or everybody who's a judge is just acting out their sadistic impulses. They might not be. They might honestly find the whole thing unpleasant, but, well, somebody's got to do this. Um, you know, like a, a butcher. Somebody's got to slit the throats of pigs. You know, we, we need bacon, right? People have to eat. Okay, there, there's... You, the world isn't a nice place, and just because people don't want to see what I do, if, say, the guy's a, a butcher in an abattoir, he doesn't want to look at what I'm doing, well, he's just not facing the reality of the situation. Or the guy who works in the slaughterhouse likes cutting the throats of pigs and chopping their bodies up, and he likes thinking that, yeah, these pigs know where they're going. <laughs> you know, um, we'll never know. But... Look at yourself long and hard in the mirror. And I think that most people who are honest with themselves know what I'm referring to. Um, that's not a shocking realization for me, but I think for a lot of people, it would be shocking. I mentioned The Last Messiah by Sopfe. Uh, that's kind of what happened to the caveman. He thought that he was just going out to kill something to eat it, but he understood that it was a lot bigger than that. He didn't live in a nice world. He didn't live in a some sort of noble savage's paradise. He was just killing things because he was stronger or smarter than they were and eating them. It wasn't he wasn't offering this up to some god in some in the moral order of things, you know, the way that people still to this day idealize native Canadians when they go out and hunt. Uh, a lot of people who are anti-hunting types in Canada, and there's a lot of them, kind of give the native Canadians an exemption. Well, they've always lived this way, and they, the way they do it is it, they don't rape nature the way everybody else does. <clears throat> and they have this quote-unquote contract with the animals, like I mentioned a few videos back, but the Innu and the seal. There's a connection there. Well, how do I know that connection is really there? Or how does anybody know that in somebody else's head that connection is really there? Maybe even the na Native Canadians really enjoyed the act of butchery. Um, but they developed this mythos that told them that what they were doing was part of a higher order. So if you like to go out and drive a whole pile of bison off a cliff so they die of smashing themselves to pieces on the rocks below... Not a nice way to die. And then the women go out with stone hammers and crush their skulls. Um, <clears throat> maybe these people actually enjoy doing this. Because they're humans, right? Um, maybe they did. That's a terrifying realization for some people. For others, it might be, well, did you think that humans have some sort of exemption when it comes from bad behavior? Even the nicest of humans? Even people we idealize, like the hunting habits of very primitive people who, you know, have this elaborate mythology surrounding it all. Why should they be exempt from the normal human sadism that we all have in our character? Um, this is not a condemnation of the human race. It's just, let's not kid ourselves. Um, we can end up with blood all over our hands. When we got into the whole thing, trying to uphold the moral order. Uh, it's terrifying, but I, I think that, uh, to, to face that realization, but I think that you can, it, it needn't smash your brain to atoms. 
It's just, okay, there. Now you're a little bit wiser. Now you see the world around you. You don't want to go back into denial. You don't want to go back into some nice little bubble, which what's, which is what a lot of people are saying is happening now to Russia. People are going back into that age-old Russian sort of sense of denial. Again, I'm not saying that this is what's actually happening. This is what you hear people saying. You pine for the good old days where everything is simple and you have a wise man in the Kremlin ruling over all of us, so you ignore everything that your eyes tell you, your senses tell you. You don't want to know. Um, we all do that, really, let's be honest. But being honest is not always an easy thing. In fact, it's terrifying. Um, we are what we are. Are you prepared to find out what we actually are? And do you think you can survive the shock? Isn't that the question?